Hello everyone and welcome to the KUL podcast, Rethinking Heat in the City. This is a series of podcasts where we look at climate change through the lens of social, economic and gender inequalities using Karachi as a backdrop. I am Akhtas Patma, an anthropologist and research associate at Karachi Urban Lab, and I will be your host today. The Karachi Urban Lab was set up in Pakistan in 2016, in a context where data production on the urban remains top-down and largely technocratic. Over the last few years, we have been investigating and understanding the complex challenges of urban planning, affordable housing, infrastructural development, and climate change. Our current project, Cool Infrastructures, Life with Heat in the Off-Grid City, is focused on four cities across Asia and Africa that are critical for understanding the future of life with heat. This project is funded by the United Kingdom's Global Challenges Research Fund. Our research project aims to enhance our understanding of social and technical infrastructures for cooling and the intersections of heat, climate, and bodies. In this episode, I am joined by Dr. Andreas Flores, who is currently one of the leading environmental physiologists in the world. We explore the field of environmental physiology and unfold its significance in climate change research through the study of heat at a cellular level. Dr. Andreas is an associate professor at the University of Tetzale in Greece and an adjunct professor at the University of Ottawa in Canada. He is the founder and director of Fame Lab, a research group investigating the health and performance effects of environmental factors with a particular focus on the impacts of heat. Dr. Flores is a partner in a series of large international projects in Europe and North America, and he has published widely on the effects of different environmental factors on human health, productivity, and performance. He is currently participating in several working groups tasked to develop prevention measures, which are aimed at reducing the impacts of environmental factors for workers, athletes, and the general population. These working groups include the World Health Organization, the International Labour Organization, and the Greek Ministry of Labour. Welcome, Dr. Andreas. Before anything else, let me ask, what is environmental physiology and how did you come across it? Environmental physiology studies how the environment, all aspects of the environment, uh, affect human physiology. Uh, The way I came across it was through sports. Um, In sports, obviously, the environment plays a tremendous impact on on how well athletes perform Uh, and that's why um, sports uh, physiology or exercise physiology has been a very important part of environmental physiology. I would say the main two pillars of environmental physiology have been from the sports side and also from the occupational and military side. These are the two main activities of humanity that uh, have really looked at how the environment impacts physiology. So when we talk about the environment in this case, uh, we refer to uh, heat, cold, air pollution, and air quality in general. We talk about altitude, diving, space. Um, These are the main uh, factors that environmental physiology looks at. Right. It's interesting that a discipline that is now so closely involved in studying climate change impacts on human physiology um, took origins in sports and occupational research. Uh, and I think that just goes to show the interlinks between a variety of disciplines when considering the study of a warming planet. Uh, moving from that, I also want to ask about the human thermoregulatory system and its ability to adapt to various climates. From an evolutionary perspective, how has the human thermoregulatory system adapted to its environment and how do we see it function today? Well, our thermoregulatory system, this is something that... Uh, not everyone is aware of. Uh, in fact, we owe our position today in the, in the balance of species on the planet on the thermoregulatory system. Um, one of the main theories of our evolution as a species of humans as a species is that we managed to um, evolve the way we have by eating meat. And this, is, this has helped our brain to um, get larger, and uh, that's how we got smarter, really. But how did we manage to eat meat, uh, a species that doesn't have that much strength, we don't have claws, we don't have uh, long and and sharp teeth? Uh, How did we manage to to, um, uh, fight these, these predators, other animals, and kill them and eat their meat? Well, what we did manage to do uh, and that's what scientists have managed to find out in the last few decades is that 
we went out as a herd and we just ran animals to death. Um, we just made groups of 10 or 20 people and we started running uh, towards animals, towards, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a group of uh, uh, giraffes or another large animal that we currently, uh, as, as a, an individual, we wouldn't be able to hunt. And then we would just run and run until the animal basically uh, die. And the reason why we were able to do that was because our federal system adapted in a way that it allowed us to, to sweat. Um, there are very few animals on the planet that have the ability to sweat. Uh, other than humans, only a few hoofed animals like horses can sweat. And also some primates uh, can sweat, but not all of them. So we are, um, a lot of people don't like sweat and we buy uh, products to avoid it, but it is really what has allowed us, the ability to sweat has allowed us to be who we become, who we have become uh, on, the, on, on this planet. So this has played an important, the regular system as, as a whole has played an important role uh, on, on, on our evolution. And it has also allowed us to be able to survive nearly in every habitat on Earth. Uh, there's not any other species that has managed to survive uh, in all the habitats of Earth except us. Um, so the thermoregulatory system is one of the main components of our physiology that has played a role in this perspective. Yeah, I think the one thing I remember studying related to that was the endurance running hypothesis. Um, and that basically linked our transition into bipedalism and the loss of body hair with our ability to use fire, um, not only for consuming meats, but also to gather warmth, which eventually allowed us to cluster into communities. And of course, the loss of hair also has implications on how we regulate temperatures in our environments. So physiologically, what are the mechanisms through which we regulate body temperatures aside from sweating? Well, it depends. That's a very good question. It depends. Um, sweating is certainly um, by far the most important uh, mechanism we use when we um, perform physical work, which means when we do household chores or when we walk outside, when we do sports. So whenever our muscles are active, uh, sweating is by far the most predominant and important uh, pathway to get rid of this heat that is being uh, built in our, in our body because of metabolism. But on the other hand, when we are just relaxing at home, watching TV or just uh, eating or you know, being passive in general, not being very active, uh, then in those cases, there's another mechanism uh, of what we, what we call blood redistribution. Uh, so what, what our body does in this case is uh, it shifts the blood from some of the organs, like the intestines, for example. It shifts the blood to the um, to the skin. For example, if we are wearing um, watches or rings in our fingers, uh, we would see our we would notice that our uh, they're starting getting constricted because our our fingers are uh, swelling. That's exactly what's happening. So our body sends blood to the skin to make it warm. And our skin comes in contact with the air, the surrounding air, and gets rid of a bit of that heat. Plus, by making our skin really, really warm, we radiate heat around us and in, in surfaces in, in walls uh, and everything that surrounds us through radiation. So when we are inactive, we use this blood redistribution. We send a lot of our blood to the skin. And this helps us to uh, alleviate this heat strain, this minimum heat strain, which we have when we are not very active. On the other hand, when we are active, sweat is by far the most important. Plus, these two are physiological mechanisms, we would call them. There's another very, very important not physiological mechanism that we use, which is our behavior. We call this behavioral thermoregulation. And what it, what it basically is, is uh, when, when our brain realizes that we're getting hot, in addition to sending blood in different areas or starting uh, making our 
sweat glands to activate and sweat, what it does is it's changing our behavior. So we would uh, turn on the air conditioning if we have one, or a fan, or we would open the window, or we would change clothes. Uh, or if we are working, or if we're exercising, uh, it makes us um, make decisions to uh, reduce the, the intensity of our work. Take breaks if we are, of course, allowed to. And this goes into occupational physiology and, and the way work is done. If we're in sports, an athlete would tell you, for example, oh, today my, my legs felt uh, heavy. But in fact, what was happening was uh, his or her brain was telling them to slow down because they're getting really hot. The same happens for a worker. And if the worker is allowed to, they take breaks and the brain normally would protect us from uh, getting uh, heat illness. But of course, there are cases both in sports uh, and in uh, traditional physiology, as well as when we're not active, when these mechanisms, the physiological and the non-physiological, the behavioral um, mechanisms, are not enough to protect us from, uh, from heat injury. Right. So taking from what you just described, I think the conversation we need to emphasize now is how far can thermoregulatory systems, whether behavioral or physiological, be stretched? What is the threshold at which your body can no longer accommodate ambient heat? I think one question to begin that conversation is, what are the best indicators or variables to study where that threshold lies? In our current project, we're using a variety of equipment that gives us a range of thermal stress indicators, and that includes temperature, humidity, heat index, wet bulb globe temperature. What variables have you worked with so far, and what do you find to be the most effective? Well, um, in, in, in our studies, we assess the three main contributors of heat strain. Heat strain and, and you know, heat injury, especially when we are working, is caused by three main factors. First is the environment, uh, and then is the clothing that a person is wearing, and then is the physical work that the person is performing. So we assess all these three factors. In terms of the environment, we looked at temperature, humidity, wind, and solar radiation. If you measure these four, they will allow you to calculate all the potential heat indices that uh, you really want, whether it's heat index, whether it's WGT, uh, Humidex, uh, the UTCI, there are um, many, many. Um, actually, we just published a series of three studies with colleagues from around the world where we looked at how many thermal uh, strain indicators have been created since antiquity. Uh, we found that uh, even uh, two millennia ago, people were still uh, actually started making these kinds of thermal stress indicators. In total, there have been 340 thermal stress indicators published to date. And we looked at which ones were the best in telling us how uh, stressful an environment is when we are performing work. And we saw that when, it, when we are dealing with workers in, in occupational settings, uh, we found out that WBGT, uh, the wet bulb globe temperature, is uh, the, the best one, followed by the UTCI, the Universal Thermal Climate Index, and then uh, a few others. Uh, so in terms of the environment, uh, we propose WBGT, but we assess all four factors, temperature, humidity, wind, and solar radiation. Then in terms of clothing, we looked at the color of the clothing that the person is wearing, we looked at the thickness of the clothing, the texture, and all these give us the insulation uh of the clothing but also we look at fit because constricted clothing tend to be um, tend to change the way they they affect heat stress compared to clothes that are uh, more loose and they allow air to go in and out uh, through them and the third factor as i mentioned before is the the physical work that the person is performing uh, and because this is really important uh, because it builds heat. Uh, I'm sure everybody understands that when somebody is, let's say, watching TV or cooking or working on the computer, they're not um, building a lot of heat inside and their body and their muscles don't produce a lot of heat compared to a person 
uh, carrying uh, something very heavy or doing some kind of uh, work digging or uh, some you know climbing stairs for example uh, running these things uh, these activities produce a lot of heat inside us uh, so the way we we study this physical work is by doing what we call task analysis so we either videotape people and then we analyze it back in the lab or uh, we use uh, a smartphone application that we have developed and we have observers and we do it in real time so we are observing workers and we are using this application to understand second by second what the person is doing so we put all these data together the environment the clothing the physical work and uh, so that we can understand the heat strain that the person is experiencing at the given point in time so there does exist a lot of categorization to determine vulnerability to heat right like you said was it 350 thermal variables that have existed 340 yeah Oh, 340. But I imagine the way these variables have been conceptualized and been put to use has also varied, right? You said wet bulb globe temperature was a strong determinant in the studies you have conducted. But even with that, there has been debate over what degree or value needs to be understood as the threshold of human survivability. Um, can you tell me a little about the significance of this value and how do you assess its validity across contrasting environments, say from Europe to South Asia to Sub-Saharan Africa? Indeed, that is a, an, an excellent point. First of all, it's really important to understand that we are now living in a in a time that where technology allows us to conduct experiments that scientists a few decades ago couldn't even imagine. So, when the WBJT was developed in the fifties and sixties, um, you couldn't go to the field and perform. Uh, measurements. You could perform observations, but not real measurements of core temperature or skin temperature or heart rate. So first of all, it's important to acknowledge that when these indicators uh, were developed, we couldn't really assess their validity in, in the field because we couldn't perform any measurements. Uh, now we're starting to do these studies as uh, the one that I just talked about to assess the validity, and that's how we managed to find that WBGT seems to work better than, than most others. Um, this is something very new, uh, couldn't do it before. Um, we now know, at least for patient settings, that WBGT is, performs best. It's still not perfect. It's far from perfect, in fact. Uh, we, we saw that um, the way we validated it was we asked a group of 20 scientists to give us their criteria of what they think is more important for a, a thermal strain indicator to have. And WBGT did come on the top, but it satisfied 55% of these criteria. So you understand that it's far from perfect. Uh, there's a lot uh, of room for improvement, but uh, is the, the best tool we have right now. Uh, now, um, I know that there are, there are some uh, uh, reports in, in different media suggesting different uh, thresholds. Uh, there's also some studies that have been done that suggest different thresholds. The, the, uh, the international standard for the WGT in terms of occupational settings is 32.2 degrees Celsius, which means that when WBGT goes beyond 32.2, work of any kind should cease. Uh, even uh, uh, at lower levels, certain amounts, certain types of work, very intense work, should uh, cease even at 31 or 30 or 29, if it's really, really heavy work. And then at 32.2 is the maximum, there you shouldn't be doing any kind of work, even, even walking around should be avoided. Uh, now, this, uh, of course, is under, it's understandable that it's, it's not possible to have um, a unified, a single number to pro equally protect and, and effectively protect people across the planet because we have people of different races with different, slightly different morphological characteristics. 
certainly different cultural characteristics. They also perform different types of work. Uh, also, we have different climates. Uh, some climates are more uh, humid, some not, uh, some more windy. Uh, there's different latitudes where you have different levels of solar radiation. So certainly, uh, although WBGT does take into account all uh, four main factors of the environment, uh, still, it's normal that uh, one single number shouldn't, uh, will not uh, effectively protect everybody. In some countries, for example, in Singapore, the, the highest level of protection, uh, actually I would say the highest level where you can do work has been set at 32.5. Uh, in other countries, like in Qatar, it has been set at 32.2. The same is for Greece. Uh, in, in, in some other countries, uh, like more northern countries, where people are not very uh, accustomed to heat, we see thresholds as low as uh, 31.5 or uh, 31.8. This, this slight variability is uh, understandable to some, some extent because people acclimatize to the environment if they're uh, exposed to heat often they have a level of uh, adaptation to it, so they are less likely to have uh, heat injury. But again, that's, that's a finite um, ability that we have. And this is important for many reasons. For example, if we're talking about a work site, um, it's wrong to think that everybody is acclimatized. Maybe a person was away for a few days, Maybe they were working somewhere else where it wasn't as hot, or maybe it just became really, really hot very, very fast and workers were not able to acclimatize. Absolutely. And I know that you're involved in a lot of work related to this at the FAME Lab. Um, what can you tell us about the lab and the studies you have been involved in related to heat? We did talk a little about it when we were discussing the different thermal variables, um, but what sort of findings related to heat have you encountered in your research? Yeah, the FAME lab is um, located in central Greece. Actually, it's the hottest part of the country. Uh, and it's, uh, it's in a department that is really university. It's, a, it's at the University of Thessaly in the Department of Exercise Science. And it's a place in the country where uh, people are very, very active, either because they're working in the field. It's in a very large uh, agricultural valley. But also, it's a, it's a place, a region where people are very sporty. There's many of Greek athletes that have uh, originated from there. Uh, so both in terms of outdoor work and in terms of sports and outdoor sports, there was a need to study uh, how the environment affects our physiology. Uh, and that's how we emerged. Mainly, uh, we started by the need to address issues with uh, athletes. But then, of course, we, we realized we need to help also the general population uh, and the working people. As well, in some cases, um, people doing um, extreme, uh, extreme things like going expeditions on the Everest um, or uh, astronauts or um, sports teams doing, uh, performing in very, very uh, extreme environments. Our studies, so our studies are uh, targeting all these populations. We primarily look at thermal regulation, so heat and cold, but we also have studied a number of other factors like altitude, air pollution, diving. We have done a lot of work with uh, helicopter pilots trying to see how we can help them cope with the uh, immense amount of heat that they have to withstand when they're driving this, uh, flying these helicopters. And always what we try to do is assess the environment and provide them with guidelines, uh, either whether we're talking about athletes or general population, workers, military, always uh, having to do with safety. Uh, and in some cases, performance uh, when we're talking about athletes. So uh, trying to make sure that people are healthy uh, safe when they're doing different activities in harsh environments. And if possible, if you secure health, then if they, if you can help them make, uh, perform a bit better, 
that's also something you know, like we, we try to do like a, as an add-on. That's really interesting. Um, as our work at the Karachi Urban Lab has focused more on cities that are heating up and its impacts on the inhabitants of these spaces, how do you think we can address the ecophysiological concerns you study in urban dwellings? Where do the themes converge? Absolutely. Uh, there's, a, there's a major uh, overlap of these, uh, these themes. For example, when we're looking, as you said, uh, urban settings, obviously we have the urban heat islands where heat is much more intense uh, during the day, but also during the night. And then coupled with that, you have air pollution, which uh, is the, the impact of air pollution when it's hot is increased because one of the mechanisms that uh, our uh, physiology uses is it increases the um, respiratory rate uh, when it's hot. So one of the reasons, uh, one of the mechanisms that we try to, to use to get rid of heat by breathing a little bit uh, harder. Also, we breathe a little bit harder because the work is tougher when we are working in a hot environment because we have shifted all our blood, not all, not all but a, a large amount of our blood to the skin, then our muscles don't have as much blood as they need. So the same work seems to be uh, more, seems to be tougher. That's why we breathe heavier. And when we are doing this work in a polluted environment, it means that we breathe in a lot more of these air pollutants or a lot more of this dust. So there's definitely a, a sort of a double threat when you are exposed to the heat, especially coupled with the urban heat island effect. And this, the, the air that you're breathing is polluted either with dust or with other particles. Uh, this would cause you to have both um, and increases the risks for uh, heat illness, but also for acute and chronic respiratory disease. Absolutely. And I think that is something we do see a lot in our work as well. Um, a very common response from people is that they feel suffocated or they're unable to breathe in the heat. Um, and I think that links to what you're saying. And I think this would be the perfect point to bring up the heat waves that have occurred across Europe recently and the devastating impacts that they have had on not only the people, but also on water reserves, food supplies, and the general ecology of the area. Um, what lessons do we take from these heat events and the frequency with which they're increasing? And also, where do conversations in the global north and the global south converge to address these concerns? Because it is no longer an independent fight, right? So, so how do we coalesce these different contexts and perspectives? This summer has been an eye-opener for Europe, uh, and it's really relevant to, to your question. Uh, Europe, especially in the center and in the north, was relatively unprepared for what has happened in the last uh, two months. Although in a number of countries, heat action plans have been designed and were in place, uh, as we have seen in a, in a recent survey that we did in collaboration with the World Health Organization Office for Europe. However, at a societal level, people had, have not been accustomed to heat in Central and North Europe. The way they lead their lives has not been adapted through decades of experiencing heat uh, uh, in much of the year, as in the global south, for example, and then also in, in South Europe as well. Uh, climate change means that societies all over the world, which includes Central and North Europe, that were never exposed to the heat, will be increasingly experiencing more and more frequent, more intense, and more prolonged heat waves. So this means that we need to help societies, we as academics, we need to help societies adapt their entire lives during the hot season. Uh, everything we do throughout the day and night, the food that we eat, the clothes that we wear, the activities that we do, and so much more, everything has to be adapted. Uh, and although, like I said before, um, almost all countries of uh, Europe do have some form of heat action plans, the societies were not adapted. People were continuing to do uh, what they are accustomed to do. The way businesses work, the way everyday family uh, life works, does not take into account heat. This is something 
this is a, a, a this is a topic where academics can play an important role uh, in the global north, but also and primarily in the global south, uh, because uh, academics in the in global south communities have studied the way of life uh, as it has adapted uh, through decades of heat exposure, uh, and it would be great, I think, if they can share their their knowledge and views. Uh, uh, in terms of the societal adaptation to heat. Uh, and the lessons of the global south from this perspective, I think, are invaluable. That is definitely food for thought, and I hope conversations like these can contribute to moving in that direction. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Andreas, for joining me and sharing some great insights with us. And thank you so much to everyone who has tuned in. If you would like to learn more about Karachi Urban Lab or the Cool Infrastructures Project, please visit us on our websites, www.karachiurbanlab.com and www.coolinfrastructures.com. Until next time, goodbye.